Right, good, good evening. I've come down from the frozen north and I'm still adapting to London's torrid uh, temperature. I think climate change is accentuated when you travel 200 miles south. Um, particularly, uh, I live in the Pennines, um, so I come down nearly 1,000 feet as well. So um, if I start taking my shirt off, excuse me. Um, the title is actually um, CAF's um, conversion of what I suggested I might speak about, which was uh, landscape, the river of life. But um, just, to, just to avoid any um, suspicion that it's about the internet and streaming um, down a telephone line, it's much more about uh, the animation of landscape um, and particularly a, a metaphor that I'll share with you um, uh, between the way water moves in the landscape and the way we as humans uh, move. But first of all, I just have um, the tradi traditional and mandatory grouse for uh, landscape architects um, against use of the word landscaping. Um, it's been taken over by the development controllers and become uh, a condition of planning permission. Um, it usually means uh, green things. Um, in the minds of the people who impose a condition and, and all too often it's used to compensate for poor architecture and applied as a cosmetic to screen or hide and so there's a whole vocabulary behind the word landscaping there's green wedge, um, screening and, and so on all words that we just uh, dispel completely um, and it also has a separate budget that's, um, that tends to be cut so we don't do that we do do that, um, and as far as I'm concerned, landscape is the whole scene, and particularly living in the, in the hills, looking down on a place like Sheffield, the whole of Sheffield and every building in Sheffield um, becomes part of the landscape once you're up above it. Um, it exists before you put buildings into it, um, and the main ingredient is space. Um, and this is where we begin to get into the theme uh, for the talk, which is the meaning of space suddenly takes on a greater uh, dimension once people occupy it. If it's deserted, we're not, we're not in the space, therefore it has no meaning for us. And particularly the movement um, of people occupying space um, is responsible for and a response to the diversity of character. So um, the, the, the stream, the mountain stream, um, becomes a very useful touchstone, particularly for someone who loves the mountains, uh, because the mountain stream has all of these characters, and, and they've got parallels in life. This could be um, a shopping high street, many, many choices of uh, directions to go, destinations, uh, dead ends, um, dwelling on the sidewalk. Um, this might be people arriving at a nightclub. Um, this could be um, office workers crossing Blackfriars Bridge. And that could be the uh, football crowd arriving or leaving uh, a stadium. And that could be the tranquility of uh, a park, a particularly restful, um, quiet corner of a garden where one's spirit uh, is refreshed and, and the calm uh, d dispels the stress of daily life. Talking of stress, um, how would you begin to describe this environment in Cardiff? Um, the, this is the main railway station, principal point of arrival at the capital city of Wales um, about 10 years ago now and um, bus station, principal distribution point and arrival point for local um, passengers. And in between, this maelstrom of completely meaningless space dominated by motor vehicles. So a first-time arrival at uh, the capital city of Wales might uh, encounter, um, and if we're just keeping the metaphor going, um, these might be alligators or crocodiles or big snapping fish. Um, certainly very dangerous things to, um, to run the gauntlet uh, in order to find your way out into the city. In fact, um, 
as things were when we were commissioned, the hatched areas uh, were the only remaining fragments of the space dedicated to pedestrian movement. The rest of that space was either um, parking, which is the hatching, or these um, streams of vehicle movements, including one that goes right the way across between the uh, railway station and the bus station and all of the pedestrian routes into the city centre. <coughs> Once we began to map the people who owned that uh, public realm, it became quite self-evident why it was so dysfunctional. Um, a completely um, mystifying set of boundaries and footprints for land ownership, and each one defending its own little patch of turf, um, and, and, and having no interest in how people sort of move from, from one piece of territory to another piece of territory. They were all um, th thinking only of their own, um, their own particular uh, business turnaround. We, we sat all of those people down for a workshop, and within half an hour, after an initial bit of squabbling, we got them all to agree two things. First of all, um, the, the, their first concern was their passengers, but virtually everybody's second concern was the general attitude of mind of the people arriving and departing. And so on a, a sort of a process of proportional representation, we got everybody to dispense with their first concern and concentrate on the shared concern, which is how we optimise the attitude of mind and the sense of pleasure and um, understanding of people um, arriving in this area that we described as the orientation zone and moving to and from the primary destinations of which there were three. Um, this one takes you round towards St. David's Hall, the cultural area, through the Middle Lane Cafe Quarter, which I'll come to shortly. Um, this route is the um, main retail core and office core. And this route is a really important cultural route. It takes you to the, uh, what is now the Millennium Stadium, but was then Cardiff Arms Park, the rugby stadium, just off the picture there. Um, the character of movement, the nature of movement, the type of people, the timing, the volume, the frequency, uh, it's completely different on each of these three pedestrian movement routes. And it, it was a simple matter to get all of those stakeholders to understand that and to um, buy into, first of all, this orientation zone, the first thing you want to do when you arrive in a, a new place is, is take stock to view the skyline and navigate intuitively where, where you would like to go. Um, so eliminating the vehicular route across the front was vital and clearing a space for that orientation to take place and then forging these um, pedestrian routes. The the key to doing that was, as I say, eliminating the movement across this, the front and getting all the taxis to come to one side and go back on themselves and all the private cars to pick up and drop off um, on the other side, again going back on themselves in order to eliminate the, the movement across here. And then this third route is the multi-storey car park um, behind the shops um, issuing out uh, that way, so no vehicles needing to cross over. Having established um, a, a series of almost sort of parting of the Red Sea to create the pedestrian routes, then we introduce the little eddies and backwaters um, by alternating between narrow um, uh, channels of movement um, into much more generous um, pools of, of 
movement, and that's reflected in the pace at which people move through these spaces, the going places, um, and slow down in the gathering and arriving places. So just to remind ourselves um, of the alligator pool and that, how that is now um, experienced as a new arrival with the um, Cadaridris sculpture by William Pye um, focusing this entirely pedestrian space so that the, there's no vehicle between um, just coming out of the door here um, and the bus station so you can walk straight to the buses without encountering vehicles. Before as it was and um, a very, very generous orientation space uh, with opportunities for spending time um, and the, the thinking behind the sculpture, not just um, a, a visual um, focal point, but more especially a, a meeting place. One of the first things that you want to do if you're arriving um, in another place and you want to meet somebody, you need a, a recognisable um, point where you can arrange to meet someone. And the importance of um, thinking the whole process through, through the hours of darkness as well as um, daylight. That's the approach from um, Mill Lane. Sorry. Just before we go into Mill Lane, just to um, connect the two um, spaces. We've been looking at this area here outside the uh, railway station. The first commission that we picked up in Cardiff was this length of street called Mill Lane, which felt as if it was somewhere off the edge of the planet. It had just been forgotten about um, and virtually no animation or n no footfall through there because all of the footfall was getting through this maelstrom as quickly as possible and disappearing up into the retail area. So this area up here, um, which is the link between the station and the retail street, that's Queen Street, St. David's Concert Hall is here. Um, this section just became very, very thinly populated. And then when we looked, this was, bear in mind this was the first um, space that we were commissioned to look at and it directly generated the commission for the railway station because we pointed out that there were local problems in Mill Lane particularly um, domination of the carriageway really mean pavement outside these restaurants um, m slightly more generous pavement on the opposite side of the road which meant that everybody walks on the opposite side of the road rather than outside the, um, the restaurants and shops. But also there were um, problems between the station and Mill Lane, which you've already seen. The car park outside the railway station was, was one of the main reasons people never even reached here. So, th so very few people arrived in Mill Lane, and those that did walked on the wrong side of the road and just got out the other end as quickly as they possibly could. We were commissioned um, by the council, but in response to the traders of the area, particularly um, rebel roused by Giovanni Malacrino, who has Gio's uh, Italian restaurant here. He'd um, had restaurants in Naples and in America and said, why can't we have outdoor cafes the same as we have elsewhere? And they managed to get all the other um, neighbours uh, to, to put into a kitty to commission a model um, which is entirely of their own volition. And then they took this model to the planners in um, Cardiff City Council and said, um, please, can we, please can you build this for us? And um, so th our brief was effectively to take that as, a, as an ambition um, and convert it into something deliverable and that required getting all of the restaurant owners um, to come to one place and talk about it which proved to be quite easy we just fed and watered them give, 
give them free um, food and drink in, in each other's restaurants, and they flocked to the meetings. Um, and then we um, also bribed the highway engineers and got them to come as well for a free feed, and, and then got them all sort of brushing up against each other. And um, very, very quickly, we arrived at um, a very simple concept, which would be to take the camber of the old road, which used to just sort of roll over like that, and, um, and chop it into a series of zones, and that each zone would have a, a, a particular function, and that that function would play um, on the psychology uh, of people inhabiting it, in order that we got a pattern of usage um, that happened intuitively rather than in response to signage and management. First thing to do is to take the, the, the vehicle out of the whole of this area, restrict that to a single um, thoroughfare, um, mainly buses but a few cars and taxis coming through as well. Um, keep the footpath on the opposite side of the road but play it down and concentrate the thoroughfare of pedestrian movement just a couple of metres away from the front doors of the restaurants um, and then create this uh, raised eating and drinking dais um, that would be almost like an island, a natural calm, a natural haven um, between two streams of movement, the vehicular stream and the pedestrian stream. Um, and if we just zoom in on this area here, and look at the way that um, that psychology works. If we allowed the pedestrian movement to go right to the door, two things are likely to happen. First of all, um, the waiter coming out with his tray of glasses and, uh, and pasta uh, would have the tray knocked out of his hand by pedestrians sort of marching up and down here. But also, the, the sense of haven on the raised eating terrace um, would feel a little bit exposed and isolated um, unless you've got this little sort of margin almost like the river bank um, happening here so the first people who tend to colonize the street cafe tend to sit here rather than out here but once there are people sitting against the wall then all of a sudden the, the, the atmosphere changes out here and, and people begin to, to fill in. So there's, a, there's an unfolding dynamic which you can watch take place every morning. The coffee starts here and then the pasta and the pizza starts out here. So um, in the space of about six months we went from that to that and most interesting of all, um, the area at the back um, the area at the back um, I might add that the only, th the only furniture that we put in here was trees, tree grills, and paving. The rest has been colonized by the uh, restaurant owners. Um, and, and this process of colonization and natural sort of habitation and, and animation w was the joy of the scheme, even more than building the, the, the paving. Building the paving was simply uh, unlocking it. Um, and, and for me, the, the regeneration gain um, that hasn't immediately been obvious to everybody is that the whole of that frontage there was the bridal um, gown, the sort of wedding shop on the ground floor. Um, but the opportunity to make money out here has meant that they've converted two-thirds of the ground floor to restaurant, um, used the remaining bay of the ground floor just as a, a portal into the bridal um, wear shop, which now has extended onto the first floor. So the scheme has um, diversified and doubled the uh, trading performance of the ground floor and brought a first floor into use that wasn't in use before. So um, if, if anyone suggests that uh, public realm improvements are just cosmetic and not 
a, a, a crucial part of um, economic regeneration, then this scheme just, just completely blasts that argument out of the water. Um, I'd like to get to some more interesting, more recent um, work, so I'm going to go very quickly through um, a couple of older schemes, but I think there are important little markers um, which are worth mentioning. Hume um, in Manchester and the evolution of um, success and failure has had a great deal to do with the quality of human movement. In the 1950s, um, it was a very, very permeable relationship with um, neighbouring parts of the city, particularly the city centre. You could walk to and from the city centre along many, many uh, routes, all of them overlooked and all of them relatively safe. Similarly, the connection through into Moss Side was uh, incredibly permeable. Um, in the 1990s, um, the whole of Hume had become almost, almost like a, a tumour um, with a casing around it, the um, A56 um, dual carriageway and then the Mancunian Way dual carriageway uh, effectively cut off uh, the whole of the city centre and the university area and, and very, very weak connections through into Moss Side. And not only were those roads um, fairly hostile, the, the opportunities to get under and over them were even more hostile. Um, these underpasses which people um, didn't like to use and therefore didn't use, um, and equally bridges with a, a huge uh, distance to cover between your home and the city centre with no overlooking at all. And the spaces within Hume, um, ample quantity of um, public open space, so an another little marker, um, when planners demand quantum of public open space, um, you have to scratch below the surface and say quantum of public open space is absolutely meaningless. The quality of the space, its meaning uh, and how it relates to people's lives uh, makes all the difference and a smaller amount of better open space is going to be more valuable than acres of, uh, of this desert that we had in Hume. Um, and two, two thoughts um, about how we sort of turn the corner on that. One was um, identifying relics and, and sort of jewels of a previous time um, embedded almost, almost a bit like the, sort of, um, the little insect of, and DNA and, um, and amber, um, the imprisoning effect of the deck access, um, enclosing and suffocating the Zion Institute which was dying on its feet, uh, St. Will's School, um, and drawing a line between those relics and the city centre became a potent generator for gathering all of the w meaningless green space into a proper um, formed and formalised park. And as soon as you give public open space the name park and give it consistent um, furnishing and quality of uh, boundary treatment, then all of a sudden meaning, um, the, the, the word park shouldn't be used lightly because it carries with it um, a sense of celebration of valuable space. Um, so that's the Zion Institute here and if we just um, look at it in um, aerial perspective, using um, an axis from the city centre over a new bridge to breach the Mancunian Way to pick up the St. Wilf's School and then extend that axis down to the Zion Institute, remove the um, crescent that wrapped around it and severed the Stretford Road, reinstate Stretford Road right the way through past the uh, central jewel of, of the space, past the library, and mark that um, act with the um, ceremonial arch, the, um, the Hume arch. So we've got two 
major landmarks um, anchoring Stratford Road and the axis and then everything else um, wraps around that and uses the Zion Institute as its focal point. Um, and if we, again, remind ourselves of the prison bars and how much uh, more space, um, airy the building fa feels once we'd removed the prison bars. Um, the other thing is about overlooking. So a, a, a celebrational boundary to the park with lots of movement, um, cars and people uh, moving along the edge of the park and habitable rooms overlooking the park. So the park is a simple piece of modern design. It, it's, not, it's not a sort of, it's not dripping with ornament, but it works quite radically in terms of um, very, very traditional urban design principles. Um, and then it's finished off with the bridge across the Mancunian Way. And I'll conclude um, with something a bit closer to home for you down here, Regent's Park uh, Open Air Theatre. Not quite urban design, but, but using the, the, the same set of, of, of sort of um, thinking about the psychology of emotion and um, response to um, spatial experience. The sense of moment and occasion uh, generated in this cauldron of the amphitheatre is really, really potent and always has been. Um, but the sense of anticlimax uh, out on the uh, bar side and all the pedestrian approaches was a real disappointment. Um, and just to emphasise, this hedge across here um, was seen as a very, very important element in the landscape because it screened, where we're, we're back with those, that vocabulary again, it screened the car park, but a car park that didn't really need to be there. Um, and the way home after the performance was through the, that car park. So the, the emotional response to a night out at Regent's Park um, a decade ago was excitement and anticipation as you walk through the beautifully maintained grounds of uh, Regent's Park itself. Arrive at the box office into this area of confusion under the trees. Um, you get your reward, the stimulation of the performance, but then you come back out into the bar. Um, the bar is not very um, appealing, so you go home and you take home with you a real feeling of anticlimax because you're taken through this grotty car park. The concept um, which we, um, we actually took with us at the interview to secure the job. Um, so this, this concept emerged in the space of an hour walking around the site. Um, the rest of the detail took about two years, but the idea of using almost like the, the the conch shell, uh, the amplif amplifying effect of a horn by sweeping out all of the clutter from this area here, um, we were able to capture the excitement and, and amplify it and take it home with you. So as, as you go home, um, the, the, the opportunity to walk through a pleasant landscape um, and not to be rushed to the opportunity to converse with your friends, share your thoughts on the performance that you've um, experienced, uh, is a complete inversion of the experience um, there was before. So just to, um, to look at what that entailed in the detail, it was largely about taking stuff away, taking all of this crap away, taking that hedge away, and taking um, the trees in the background that were casting shade, taking those away, and creating a much more permeable relationship between the bar and um, a, a sitting bench and a, a much more generous walking route. And as you go around the corner, um, opening out uh, into a really permeable connection to... Um, sorry, I've got more slides than I thought. Um, looking back, that's the hedge again. So 
once you're in the car park looking back, um, the hedge was removed, new path, um, new, perform new rehearsal space. Um, there's actually a building behind this, believe it or not, um, with numerous entrances uh, straight off the path. So that serves as a, a rehearsal room and corporate entertainment. Um, and the picnic lawn replaces the car park. The view. Um, so, so, so that was the that was the walk home. Um, fortunately, if you go to an evening performance, it was dark, so you couldn't see all this. Um, that was the picnic lawn um, before it opened, and as Kath enjoying the product, the fruits of um, her own work. And home time for Regent's Park, home time for you. Thank you.